And welcome back, everybody, to the Law and Crime Network. Night court underway here. Michael Bryant with you for the next... So that's quite a mess. So what we have on the stand here is Dr. Sophie Valk, and, and she's, you know, she's caught in the crossfire here. You know, you've got uh, both direct and cross-examination by attorneys who are trying to focus on one very tiny thing, and that is the absence of Kathy Durst for her medical rotation and how that all came about. So luckily, Lada Yuretzian is here and Matthew Barhoma here to help go through this. Matthew, I left you in the, in the dust there back when we had our last break. So let me start with you. Make some sense out of this for us. Well, you know, the prosecution here on this, on this uh, direct examination could have been a whole lot more efficient. They could have asked uh, questions that maybe even take the sting out of what the defense is going to ultimately and foreseeably try and bring out about uh, uh, Kathy Durst's absence. Um, and, and that's a good strategy, usually, to keep the jury informed, to keep them um, on your side and to keep them stimulated in what you have to say and not pay attention to any kind of negative from the other side. Didn't happen here, and both sides seem to kind of quarrel um, over uh, um, Kathy Durst and what she keeps up with uh, back uh, when she was in school. Yeah, you know, just contextually, again, uh, Sophie Balk is there because Kathy Durst was a student doing rotations at that time, and the theory being she dropped out of school for some reason. If you believe the prosecution, it was because uh, Mr. Durst killed her. If you believe the defense, she was having a cocaine problem and just couldn't manage. Um, Lada, let me ask you this question. It's more um, procedural. You know, uh, one of the worst things an attorney can hear when the, a trial starts is the judge saying, I don't take speaking objections. Uh, the last thing an attorney wants to hear is keep quiet. And uh, Attorney Lewin is struggling with this concept, it seems to me. We've seen so much stuff that we expect to see uh, on appeal. I'm, I'm focusing quite often on the films that are going to be played in this trial. One a documentary, one a full-blown feature, fictional uh, dramatization. What's your take on how those pieces of evidence fit in this case and the potential for an appeal based on their admission? Absolutely. I mean, there is so much here for appellate issues to come. God knows which one's going to come first. Uh, but ultimately, you know, going back to the officer, the officer, there is a material stretch in time over when the jury could sincerely be able to digest um, their, the, 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 the uh, information there uh, between cross and actual direct examination. Even more, there's maybe insufficiency of the evidence issues uh, where the defense really brought out uh, maybe you didn't cover the crime scene in full. Um, you know, did you secure the back end? Um, and what does that do for the evidence? And how big is this, uh, um, you know, potential investigation really ought to be? So there's, you know, potential insufficiency of the evidence, not to mention the conundrum of a, a number of other trials and a number of other pieces of testimony that are coming in. Um, you know, certainly a, a verdict I don't think is over um, for this case. I think that there's more to come on this case, even after a verdict on appeal. So uh, it's good to know what's going on out there and that this is not a house in the middle of a tract. This is like hills all over the place and you might not even know this house is there because it is such a shrouded uh, kind of development. So important points, guys. Appreciate all of that insight. We're going to take a break now. The court is on a break. When they come back live, of course, we will be there. Let's do a little uh, business right now and we'll be back. This is the Law and Crime Network.